Welcome everyone. Glad to see you on my channel. Today I will tell you about an unusual story. An amazing story about companionship and love. I wish you a pleasant audience. I hate you, Jill yelled into the back of her husband as he left the apartment. Bastard traitor. She grabbed dishes and threw them to the floor, and they shattered. Hundreds of colorful shards squeaked beneath her feet, and she still couldn't calm down. Tears were pouring from her eyes like a hailstorm. I'm going to kill her. She froze for a moment, declaring to her reflection in Jill's mirror, and I'm going to kill him. For all the years of humiliation and resentment, it's all his fault he ruined my life. She stopped sobbing, feeling empty inside, wiping her red eyes and swollen nose with the back of her hand. She had been married for 17 years, and in that time, Martin had had more than one affair. He was a sucker for young girls, but all his flinging affairs ended rather quickly. The husband gave gifts to his wife and children, as if apologizing, and a kind of peace and happiness reigned in the family. Their family life looked like a pretty picture. There were two wonderful teenage children, an apartment downtown, a summer cottage, two cars, a lot of money, and if you turned a blind eye to Martin's affairs, you could consider their life perfect. And Jill played the game without showing that she was well aware of her husband's infidelity. She had put up with it for so many years, and she had never wanted to ruin the family plans. And now her son was getting ready to go to a prestigious university. Her daughter was taking music lessons from a private teacher. Yes, they were going to fly to Hawaii in a month. They had already chosen a hotel and booked a trip. And then this. She replayed every minute of that ill-fated evening in her head. Today, when she returned home from work, she found it did not bode well. Jill was worried. Was he about to start screaming that the kitchen floor wasn't clean enough? Or maybe he'd noticed cobwebs somewhere. Or maybe his pants didn't seem well ironed. It would be better to be as she fantasized. After all, it could be fixed or just apologized for, and everything would be the same. But the conversation took a different scenario. I have long wanted to tell you that I love another woman, my husband said. I want to live with her. You and the children can stay in this apartment, and then I will think about what to do. After these words, Martin stepped into the hallway, grabbed his jacket, a small traveling bag, and opened the door. It was as if a dam had burst inside Jill. Everything that for years had remained unspoken, safely hidden in the far corners of her soul, sweeping away all conscious inhibitions, rushed out a stream of swear words that she had never said to her husband. She could not stop it and did not say that she felt better after what was said. Jill took up sweeping away the shards of broken crockery, thinking of the fact that in the same way her measured, though not perfect, family life had just shattered into small, meaningless pieces. Martin had always lived a kind of detached life, not really getting involved in what was going on at home, preferring to just give her money to get Jill off her back with all the little things. It had always been that way, and the money actually covered a lot of the difficulties that arose, helped her to survive her husband's cheating, and he himself always came home to his wife and children when he had a good time once again. What went wrong now? Why did he decide to just drop everything, turn over a new leaf and start a new life? It was an act that Jill could not quite put down in her head. But worse was the fact that she herself did not know how to live her life now. From a young age, Jill had dreamed of becoming a doctor. And this dream took over all her thoughts and time for university admission. The simple girl from a small village was preparing not distracted by walks with friends, school nights and discos, she studied chemistry, biology, so she could pass her exams and become a student. And she succeeded. She passed her school graduation and admission to university with straight A's. And then she made friends and became the favorite of the entire group in the medical school. Since the first year, the girls tried to imitate her in everything, but she did not give up and remained the same open, good-natured and cheerful. And no one knew how vulnerable she really was. Jill hid that from prying eyes. 
She didn't have time to meet guys, and there was an abundance of them in her class. She studied all day long. Jill didn't even think about relationships. She wanted to know more and better than anyone else about her future profession. By the time she chose to specialize, she planned to study neurosurgery. She didn't pay attention to the fact that guys turned on her. After all, her goal was to become a good doctor. She had to cut her long braid. It was difficult to take care of such hair in the dormitory. At the hairdresser's, she got a fancy braid haircut, and it suited her amazingly, making her delicate facial features even cuter. They met Martin by chance. Jill had come to practice at a teaching hospital, and one day an ambulance brought in a man with a work-related injury. He was accompanied by the shift manager of the factory where the injured man worked. He moved from leg to leg in the corridor and waited for the verdict of the doctors. The doctor asked the trainee to take the escort's document. She went out into the corridor and, without looking at the young man, complied with the doctor's request. Martin, and it was him, when he saw the girl, turned on all his charm, but she did not notice, did not respond to his smile, and then he was waiting for her with flowers at the exit of the department when her shift was over. Jill walked by, but he caught up with her and offered to drive her to her dorm in his car. They got to know each other. Martin turned out to be 12 years older. Of course, he had a lot of experience with the female sex even then. An attentive and wealthy man persistently winning a girl's attention. He gave flowers and presented me imported things which were in short supply at that time. He said that his friend brought Italian boots from abroad, but his wife was too little. I think they should fit. And this dress was offered at work. I immediately imagined how good you would feel in it. My roommates clucked their tongues enviously and said, Jill, you got a lucky ticket and seeing your girlfriend's new clothes. Sometimes they ask to let you wear these beauties once in a while. Jill's parents, the villagers, didn't like the sun. In law candidate right away. The gifts did the trick. My mother only asked me to finish my studies and then to play the wedding. Martin assured Jill's parents that this would be the case, but it turned out otherwise. At the beginning of her fourth year, Jill went with Martin to his dacha, helping to gather the fall harvest, a basket of ruddy apples, a case of bunches of honey-ripe grapes carried into town. She laughed, offered to make jam for winter, and Martin kissing her thin fingers, as if doubting specified whether such a busy girl had time to make preparations for winter. But then she really wanted to impress and to show her economic skills. But it all did not go according to plan. The car broke down on the way, and the lovers returned to town well past midnight. There was no way to get to the dormitory. The buses no longer ran. Jill could not ask Martin for money in a cab, and there was no way to get a car at night. Besides, the janitor would not let her into the dormitory so late. She had to stay overnight at Martin's apartment. That night was the first time they had ever been intimate, and in the morning Jill returned to the dormitory perfectly happy. Her friends questioned her about how and where she had spent the night, but she said nothing. After a couple of weeks of strenuous study, Jill felt completely overwhelmed. Diagnosed by her girlfriends, future doctors, she just needed to sleep it off, but it didn't help. She wanted to sleep all the time, and then there was nausea in the mornings, and during the day she felt weak and quickly fatigued, and Jill realized that she was pregnant. A little life was growing inside of her. She pondered for a long time whether she should tell Martin. What about her studies? Should she quietly terminate the pregnancy? As long as deadlines allowed, but as a future doctor knew very well about the consequences, she was plagued with doubt and advice. Love and a personal life is good, but I agree that you should have a profession. It's important. The only thing I can help you with is transferring to a medical school. The director there, my classmate, will have time to get your nursing degree before you give birth. And then, if life gives you a chance, you can go back and finish university. She had to change her whole life. She practically stopped communicating with her student friends. Her husband didn't welcome visitors. He was very demanding at home. Jill struggled to make it to class in time, to cook him a variety of breakfasts, 
to iron his shirts so they were without a single crease to a shine, to clean his apartment daily. Talking on the phone, including with his mother, was not welcomed by Martin, so even communication with close relatives came to naught, and every day there was not enough to do, and Jill was also preparing for her final qualifying exams for her nursing degree. The good thing was that her condition had returned to relative normalcy. The nausea was gone, the weakness had abated when she started taking her vitamins. The only thing was that Martin was not always happy with his attitude. He began to yell and sometimes behave harshly. There were times when Jill cried from resentment and he apologized, gave gifts, cursed himself aloud and asked forgiveness. And she forgave because there was love. Jill now realized that Martin was not at all the man she had thought he was from the beginning of their relationship when she had loved him sincerely and with all her heart. She first suspected him of adultery when her son was born, but she did not want to believe the lipstick on his shirt or the smell of perfume from her husband and did not dare to ask him. Then one day, she accidentally saw him with a beautiful girl. Their passionate kiss left no doubt that binds their love affair, and then all their lives together, he was faithful to her. Falling in love with young beauties as silly as she once was herself, agreeing once for a night of love, and it ruined all further plans, leaving her without a degree in medicine. Years later, when Martin started yelling at her, Jill had already learned to deduce from his tone that he had a new crush. She had long ago lost track of this affair. One day, when the family was growing up two children, she still could not stand it, and told her husband everything that sorely felt. And instead of an apology, Martin blamed her for everything. He said that a man will not look around with a good wife, and she herself is to blame. She hadn't looked like herself for a long time. He hated going to bed with her. Then he brought gifts for her and the children and apologized as usual. And Jill said she forgave him. Only in her soul resentment accumulated and she realized that Martin would never change, that he would always have mistresses and she could only endure and turn a blind eye. How she hated them for their youth and beauty, for the fact that these fools still had everything ahead of them and she could not change anything in her life and did not want to. Many times she followed her husband to find out who he met in the evenings, what restaurant he took the girls to, what hotel he invited them to. Why did she do it? Jill couldn't answer that question for herself, and then there was a lull for a while. It was as if her husband had gone for a walk and calmed down. Jill breathed a sigh of relief and somehow thought that her family life was finally back on track. But about a year ago, Martin started staying late at work again, suddenly canceled a family trip. And then she and the kids went to the mountains without him. He cited being busy. When she returned, Jill couldn't find her place. She again suspected her husband was cheating on her and decided to watch him. One evening, she saw Martin come out of work with a bright, beautiful girl, very young, but looking impeccable. Jill stated then, her heart clenched again with resentment and anger. But she decided to behave as if nothing had happened, not to have a showdown with her husband, she thought. She had done it before, but the girl was not so simple. She had captured Martin's attention for a long time, and now she had taken him out of the family. Jill clenched her fists again. It's okay. I'll find out where she goes and where she works. I won't let them live and enjoy themselves, and with that thought she passed out. Her sleep was so deep that the ringing of her cell phone didn't wake her up right away. Jill didn't want to answer it, slipped it under her pillow, but the phone kept repeating her favorite tune. It was hard to open her eyes and wiggle out of the dreams, which were pleasant and serene, unlike her real life, with the head nurse glowing on the screen. Finally awake, Jill replied, Yes, Catherine Smith. You were never late. Were you sick or did something happen? Fatigue knocked me down. Wake up, have some coffee, and come over. Change Ashley. Jill pulled herself together, changed her clothes, and went downstairs. She started her baby and drove the familiar route. The maternity ward where she worked was in turmoil. As luck would have it, it was on her shift that the most difficult deliveries came in, and the number of caesarean surgeries exceeded the other shifts by twice, if not more.
Not with our luck to sleep on the shift, usually joked Jill and went to her duties. She was very appreciated in the department. Many doctors preferred to be on duty with her on the same shift. Nurse Green had the ability to perform any medical manipulation easily and accurately, and doctors understand just by looking quickly gave the necessary... That's why Martin left. His mistress decided to have his baby, and he's willing to give up their son and daughter for her. But now that bitch is in Jill's full power. But now that bitch is in Jill's full power. What a gift from the universe, she said in her sleep. Jill circled the sterile table with her eyes. The scalpel short, it wouldn't reach her heart, but the carotid artery was the place. Jill really clutched the scalpel in her hand, not thinking of the consequences of such a fateful step she had decided to take. She brought her hand up for a hard blow from above, and suddenly she felt someone grip her wrists very tightly. Jill jerked sharply and turned around. The anesthesiologist was standing behind her. Have you lost your mind, he yelled. And then Jill burst into tears. Her plans, such a wonderful opportunity to get back at this trashy woman, were ruined by the interference of an outsider. The bastard broke my family in hysterics, she screamed, trying to wrench her hand from her clenched scalpel. The doctor turned her around to face him and slapped her across the face. Jill threw the scalpel to the floor and ran out of the operating room. Her cheek was burning. Sterility was compromised and preparations for surgery were delayed. Without a nurse, it was hard to get started. They looked for her. They called for her, but she locked herself in the service bathroom and cried her eyes out. One of her colleagues had a spare key. The door was opened, she was sedated and taken to the residence room. For the first time in the department's history, it was impossible to count on Green. Another nurse from surgery came in for surgery. Jill was unable to work that day. As, however, the next day, the senior nurse on the ward made a replacement, and Jill lay alone in her empty apartment feeling sorry for herself. It was so unbearably painful in her soul, she was ready to kill, not thinking about the consequences. She hated the doctor. She did it because he would not let her commit lynching. After 24 hours, she calmed down a little and still forced herself out of the apartment. There was no food at home and she threw out the leftovers of the missing food, but Jill thought that getting out of the house would do her good. It would distract her from thoughts of her traitorous husband and his mistress. The New Year's Eve parking lot at the nearest supermarket wasn't much of a spot, so she drove to another, which was also crowded, and a third detour in the parking lot yielded results. A parking space was found near the entrance. Jill pressed the alarm fob and stepped through the glass doors of the store. She grabbed her cart and headed for the refrigerators, filling her basket with goodies, heading for the cash register, and suddenly stopped. I'm alone. Who's going to cook? I went back and unloaded half of it. I thought about it for a while and put some more out. At that time, a young fortune teller appeared nearby. Give me your pen. I'll tell you the whole truth. Looking straight into her eyes, she declared, but Jill glanced at her silently, irritated. All right, sighed the gypsy. I'll just tell you. You should be grateful to the man who stopped you from doing the wrong thing, and soon your life will be turned upside down. You'll be able to love and know what it's like to be loved. I'm married. It's not about me. Jill declared. But she was surprised to hear about the irreparable. She regretted that the doctor had interrupted her, but he'd actually saved her from going to jail. Surely Martin had driven her to the point of a foggy head, to the point of some husband. You'll meet someone who appreciates you. While Jill was trying to find the words to answer, the fortune teller turned and walked away. Jill looked after her with surprise noting that the pain in her heart was somehow dulled. After all, it was not for nothing that she had left the house. She stood in line at the cash register, took the bags and realized that she just could not remember which sector the car was in. And it was a real New Year's weather outside. Snow and wind. No romantic fluffy snowflakes. She didn't care about such niceties. She paused, remembering which of the four entrances she had entered the supermarket, and as she oriented herself, 
She hurried to the parking lot to look for her car. It was covered with snow. How long had she been gone? It seemed to her that she ran into the store for about 15 minutes. It turned out that it took her 10 times as long. She looked at the people running past, busy with the hustle and bustle of New Year's Eve. Someone was carrying a Christmas tree. Someone was carrying gift bags, and she realized that she had no one to celebrate the holiday with. The children are at their mother's in the village, and her husband left her. Better to go to work. In the car, she dialed the number of the head nurse. She answered right away. Jill, how are you? We don't have anybody to work with. Can you come out? Yes. Yes. Great. Then let's take a 24-hour shift. New Year's Eve is going to be a tough one. Jill arrived and immediately plunged into the familiar work of surgery. Toward evening, the stitches of the operated mommy had to be worked on. Jill took a list of names and rolled her mobile table from room to room, doing dressings, making recommendations. And here was the last room. This was where Clara, her husband's mistress, lay. Jill didn't want to go in. She couldn't see the woman she'd tried to kill. No, she wasn't going to try to get even with her like that again. And she hadn't yet decided how she was going to get revenge for what she'd been through. Right now, she just didn't want to see her, that's all. Jill stopped in the hallway in front of the veep room and struggled with herself. At that moment, the head nurse came up. She was unaware of what had actually happened in the operating room. The anesthesiologist said that Jill had had a breakdown because her husband had left her, so there had been hysteria and so forth. Jill, is the last room left? asked the woman. Let's go together. There is a very demanding young woman here, displeased with everything, demanding increased attention. Catherine Smith opened the door herself and asked affectionately, How are you feeling? We're going to do a bandage now. Again, with the hands, the nurses will hurt you with band. AIDS, her husband's mistress, Clara, grumbled unhappily. Jill Green is the best nurse we've got. She's got golden hands. You won't even feel any discomfort. Jill pulled all her will into a fist. She just had to get the job done. It was so easy, after all, but she still couldn't make a good bandage. The bandage was crooked. Clara didn't seem to notice. Let's go back to my place for tea, Catherine Green suggested, as she helped Jill roll the table out of the room. Jill nodded. When she had disassembled the instruments, she went into the older woman's office. It was clear to her that she wanted to talk about what had happened in the operating room. Tell me, what happened to you? she asked. There have been too many rumors in your absence. My husband left me. There were tears in Jill's eyes. surprised the older woman and his child. I think it's his. Jill, honey, I'm very sorry for you. And in such a difficult situation, there is no advice, and you don't ask for it. I'll tell you one thing. Try to love yourself. She smiled tenderly. Promise me that tomorrow you will go to the beauty salon and get a new haircut. I don't want anything. Jill didn't respond very kindly. She already regretted telling her older sister about her trouble. She hadn't felt the need to turn her soul upside down in front of her. She was thinking of going away for a week. A change of scenery? Continued the interlocutor. You might come back with a different attitude. Catherine Smith, I don't know how to go on living, and you talk about vacations and hairstyles. Come on, you're young and beautiful. Children are growing up adorable. And you'll be fending off admirers, too. Mark my words. All men are the same, Jill blurted out. So you know a lot of men, then, that you're jumping to conclusions like that? Martin had had enough. You shouldn't judge everyone by one lousy sheep. And in general, remember, the main rule of life, everyone will get his own. How about I sign you up with my handyman? She's a real miracle worker, making my three hairs look like that. Do you want to go together? I'll think about it. Calmer now, Jill replied. Thank you for your support. Next shift, 
Two days later, Jill found out that Clara Adams wouldn't let the other nurses near her, demanding that the other nurses near her, demanding that the attentive one do the bandaging, meaning Jill, but she wouldn't even go near her. The older one just dragged Jill into the room, carefully watching her every move. There's the smart girl praised Catherine Smith as they left the Veep room. Leave it to a higher power to retaliate. I can't see her, I can't see her. Be patient. We'll discharge her soon. By the way, a man came to see her and brought her a package. And it's not your Martin at all. So without a vendetta, maybe it's not your husband's baby. And Jill thought the older woman was just trying to comfort her, to change her mind and even convince her that Clara wasn't her husband's mistress at all. But of course, Jill didn't believe her. Later in the evening, she realized the plan had matured. Since Clara liked her so much, she could pretend and gain her complete trust. Yes, Jill would communicate with her after she was discharged and find a way to ruin her life. Or maybe even manage to get Martin back into the family, but she will make him suffer. In the evening, Jill walked through the door of the Vipe room. Clara Adams, how are you feeling? As kindly as she could, she asked. Oh, it's great that you were on duty today. You seem to be the most adequate one here. Tell me, when is it safe to start doing abs? I don't like it so much that the muscles had to be cut. You shouldn't rush into this. Even if on the outside it will tighten, but on the inside it is a longer process. In order not to provoke a divergence, one must be careful. Jill hid her hatred, trying to act casual. And Clara suddenly decided to be frank with her. I didn't really want this baby. I gave birth to keep the man. He is wealthy, twenty years older than me. Now he left on a business trip right on New Year's Eve. And I went into labor, and everything did not go according to plan. I was hoping to give birth on my own, and there was a C-section. But he called, excited about his son. When he comes back, we'll buy an apartment and live together. He hadn't divorced his old wife yet, though. She didn't even cook for him. She didn't even clean the apartment. Jill listened to Clara, showing no emotion. But inside, she was seething with anger. How she didn't cook. She spent more time at the stove than she let herself sleep, so that her husband and children had a choice of what they wanted to eat. She cooked the tastiest and healthiest things almost every day. The first meal was obligatory, the second. Not just one dish, but several. And there was nothing to say about desserts. There was no equal in this area. Even her husband noted it more than once. But it turned out that he said such things to his mistress about his lawful wife and how Jill kept order in the apartment. That not a speck of dust, not a grain of dirt, and she did not do anything. From the lips of her husband's young mistress sounded hurtful words. After all, she did not know with whom she was really frank. I do not really like to cook myself, Clara continued. I asked my mother to come and make for me a half-finished meal, only to put a little flour on the table on the griddle, and my hands out when I hear what he walks in. She laughed, remembering her resourcefulness. So I go to meet him at the door, and he thinks that I am such a leader. Clara prepared especially carefully for the day of discharge. She was expecting the baby's father to arrive. Jill wasn't working that day, but she decided to watch the trader's husband from afar. She drove her car up to the ward and hurried into the waiting room. When she heard Jill Green come to us, she turned around and saw Clara with a bouquet of flowers. Next to her was a middle-aged woman and a man about her age with an envelope containing a contented toddler sniffing. We are so grateful. The woman spoke. Thank you for the hat, and thank you for the baby. This is my mother, Clara said. And this is my brother Andrew. Daddy's going to be away on business for a while. My mom and Andrew are here. So Martin's on a business trip. But he'll be back with that young slut anyway, Jill thought angrily. But she put on a friendly face and congratulated Clara and her son Matthew on their discharge. She was just trying to think of an excuse to continue their acquaintance so she could proceed with her plan. As Clara herself asked for Jill's phone number, explaining that she was an inexperienced mother and wanted to at least ask a competent worker for advice once in a while, Jill was jubilant inside. Everything was going according to her script. 
I'll act according to the circumstances, thought Jill. The time will come, and she'll reveal the truth about Martin. Maybe even ask him when they meet in the presence of Clara and her relatives. They say I didn't make your lunches and dinners. I didn't clean your apartment. Maybe I quit school just because I was bored with it. What will he say then? How would he feel? Although such scoundrels probably feel no shame. The very next day, Clara called and asked for help, saying she was having trouble breastfeeding, although there was nothing like that in the maternity ward. Jill drove to the address immediately after work. When she arrived, she checked to see if Clara was freezing somewhere. It turned out that she had gone to the beauty parlor for a massage, leaving little Matthew with his mother and brother. It was chilly in there, but she didn't pay attention. Now the fever had risen and the baby was refusing to breastfeed, which had become hard. Jill wrote a list of medications she needed. She did not forget about the baby food, because the baby needs something to feed and breastfeeding will have to be temporarily interrupted due to the mother's taking antibiotics. Andrew immediately went to the pharmacy and brought the necessary medicine. After the IV, Clara fell asleep and her fever began to drop. With her brother, Jill dressed Matthew to go out for a walk with him. It was windy outside and they wandered with Andrew near the park. Andrew was saying something about his life and Jill wasn't listening. She was immersed in her own thoughts. Somehow Clara reminded her of her own younger sister Alice, because of whom she had quarreled with her parents, and then she had not been in her native village for years. Jill herself was the eldest daughter in the Green family. Alice was born eight years later. The younger sister was surprisingly pretty in her childhood years, and growing up became a real beauty. They lived in a small village. My mother worked as a kindergarten teacher. Her father drove a motorcade. Their small, cozy house with a vegetable garden was always buried in verdure. Flowers grew in the front garden. They adorned the windows, as was the custom in their family. The parents were natives of the settlement, together since their school years and throughout their lives. They were unusually close-knit and friendly. They went to and from work together. The daughters were taught to keep the house and vegetable garden in order. The whole family went out to the fields and harvested crops together and made provisions for the winter. Discord with her parents and younger sister Alice happened one summer when Jill came on vacation with her husband and son and little daughter. The men had been working all day on restoring the old roof of the summer kitchen and in the evening they decided to go to the river for a swim. Alice went with her father and son-in-law. Jill stayed behind to make dinner and said she might come back later. But just half an hour later, her mother told her that she would finish the cooking herself and keep an eye on the children. So Jill hurried to the river. She could hear her sister laughing from afar and the splashing of the water. And as she got closer, she was dumbfounded. Alice and Martin were floundering noisily in the water, hugging each other, and her father was not there. Jealousy clouded the young woman's mind. Her husband in the arms of another, and not just any other, but her own sister. She already knew that her husband could be unfaithful to her, but she did not expect her sister to be a traitor. Jill made a scandal right on the beach, slapped Alice in the face and ran in tears to her parents' house. Her father had already made it back. He went the other way, so they missed each other. When the eldest daughter, screaming and sobbing, began to tell what happened, both father and mother said that this could not be, that Jill was just imagining things. Alice has a boyfriend. She's getting married, and Martin is old enough to be her father. She's not going to have an affair with him, especially since he's her sister's husband. Jill was offended because she had seen it with her own eyes, and they didn't believe her. Her parents defended their youngest daughter. When her husband returned, she insisted that he take their things to the car. Not for a minute could she stay in her parents' house. Martin's explanation seemed a silly excuse, but she blamed not him, but her sister, who had chosen to remain silent, and she hadn't been to her parents' house for years after the scandal. She read her mother's letters, but did not answer them. She was greatly resentful of both her sister and her parents. When she had gone to the village last summer, 
She had been very worried about how she would be greeted and what to say to her, but she couldn't put off reconciliation any longer, and her mother had stopped writing even sooner. Jill wanted to know how her family was doing, and her resentment toward her sister had subsided a little. Jill hesitantly opened the gate. The courtyard looked untidy. The once bright and blooming front garden was overgrown with weeds. The flowers were gone, and the roses were briars. None of this was at all consistent with her knowledge of her home. Jill glanced perplexedly around the yard and the house, noting that everything was dilapidated and in need of repair. She pulled the front door, which was unlocked. A blonde kid with a lollipop in his mouth popped up on the threshold. Hi. Let's get acquainted. Jill smiled. Without taking the candy out of his mouth, he said, and the kid ran back into the house. Jill walked in. The pungent smell of a mixture of medicine, urine, and other unpleasant odors hit her nose. Opening the door to the room, she froze on the threshold. On the couch lay her father, but completely gray-haired. His facial features were unrecognizable, deep wrinkles depicted his forehead and cheeks. Seeing his daughter, he tried to get up, but could not. Tears flowed down his cheeks. He wiped them with his left hand, his right hand he could not lift. He did not speak. He only made slurred noises, and a part of his face was twisted. There was no doubt about it. Father had suffered a stroke. Jill couldn't hold back the tears. The baby was spinning beside her. And there was no one else. Where were the other family members? Neither the father nor the child could say. Jill put her bags in the living room on a dirty stool and wondered for a moment where to begin. The sheer number of things to do caught her eye. She started with the kitchen, scrubbed it clean, wiped down all the tables and cabinets, opened the windows wide, and then she thought the smell of a sick person was no longer so pungent. She wanted to go on, but there was no way around it, and she couldn't find any more. There was no baking soda, no detergent, not even soap. She opened the refrigerator and was literally dumbfounded. There was practically no food. Jill fed the baby and her father, cooked the last of the cereal into porridge, added some leftover sugar, put the baby to bed, and decided to make a quick run to the store. A woman she knew was selling at the nearest one to the house. She lived next door. They recognized each other at once. Are you here to help? She asked Jill. She didn't immediately know what to say. She just nodded. She nodded. That's right. Was it worth it to remember old grudges when your own people had so much grief? As your son-in-law was buried, your father was paralyzed. The poor man couldn't bear the loss. Alice was pregnant when her husband Jason died stupidly. Drunk driving. Your mother takes your eldest girl with her to kindergarten. Works double shifts. She doesn't have enough money anyway, but come on, you'll find out. Jill was beginning to understand something. But one thing she couldn't get out of her head. Why a paralyzed father and a small child were left home alone. Having done her shopping, she hurried to her parents' house. And by the time her mother arrived, she had time to finish cleaning, make soup, wash and feed her father. Change his bedding and remove the unpleasant smell that had so struck her. At first had time to air out, giving way to the aroma of food and cleanliness. When the front door swung open, Jill was hand, washing the baby's baby clothes and he was hanging around. She heard her mother's loud exclamation, Alice. When did you have time to clean the house like that? Jill wiped her hands on a towel and came out of the bathroom. Her mother froze as if she had seen her eldest daughter. Jill, you, exhaled a woman. Emotions overwhelmed both of them. They hugged each other and cried. This was not at all how she had imagined this meeting. Her mother looked very old and exhausted. And no wonder, given the circumstances, she was holding the hand of a skinny little girl. Meet Sabrina. This is your Aunt Jill. Where is Alice? Her mother asked worriedly. When I got home, she wasn't there. Jill was pouring soup on plates and my mom got the jars of food she'd brought with her from kindergarten out of the bag. I was, of course, 
Very surprised that the baby and the sick father were the only ones left at home, Jill continued. Do you see what's wrong with Dad? Through her tears, my mother spoke. I didn't write to you anymore. You didn't answer your letters. The little girl came up to her grandmother and put her thin arms around her knees. And the baby asked to hold Jill in her arms, because in the twelve hours they had spent together, he had already become accustomed to her. Mom, I'm sorry it took me so long to come and see you. Jill started, and if I'd known you had such grief with your father, isn't it just grief? And she repeated what Jill had already heard from the store clerk. Your sister's life had gone to hell, hanging out with strange men all night long. But she was always home with Chris and her father during the day. Maybe she went out for a while. She never left them alone. Jill didn't mention that she had spent hours in the house cleaning and cooking, so her sister had been gone quite a while. And if she was home every day, why didn't she go over and cook her own food? The four of us sat down at the table and decided not to wait for Alice. She did not appear later. The father fell asleep. The women put the children to bed and went back to the kitchen for tea. And finally talk about the conflict that caused such a long separation in the family. They tried not to remember. The mother talked about Alice's troubles, trying to make excuses for her, and that made Jill very angry. Mom, we have nothing to feel sorry for her. It would be better to think more about the children. Where is she now? I'm afraid something has happened to her. With tears in her eyes, the mother confessed. How can I not feel sorry for my daughter, who has nothing but misfortune? Jill sighed, and rightly so. It's her anger at her sister that doesn't go away, and to her mother, they're both daughters, and more pity for the one who turned out to be unhappy. In the morning from an unknown number came a message from Alice, where she wrote that she had to leave urgently. She would soon make herself known, but in the meantime, she asked her mother to take care of the children. The same day, it became known that the day before in a traffic accident, a few kilometers from the village killed one of the lovers of Alice, and the other disappeared with her. Apparently, they left together, and in the evening, the father died, as if on purpose to wait for his eldest daughter. After the funeral, Jill insisted that her mother quit her job. Now she had to take care of the two little ones alone. She filled the refrigerator with groceries, and for the weekend she came with her children. She brought the money she had been saving just in case. Martin did not know about them, and he was somehow indifferent to the troubles of his wife's in-laws. He wasn't at his father-in-law's funeral, but he gave Gil money. He hadn't heard from Alice since then. It had been six months. Mom had given up a lot during that time. Jill came by herself or with her son and daughter. Every weekend for New Year's vacations, she took the children to the village. They volunteered to help their grandmother with the little ones. And Jill was thinking about what to do next, when in her life, too, there was such a steep turn. Now she is without a husband. To help financially mother becomes more difficult. And after the vacations, she'd be alone again with the kids. From these not cheerful thoughts, she was brought back to reality by Andrew's question. Jill, do you have a family? children of your own, or do you devote all your time to work? I have two children, teenagers now. She didn't say anything about her husband, the rival's brother. They went back to the apartment. Jill undressed Matthew out of her hurried home to get some rest and back to her shift. Andrew went out to escort the visitor to the car and offered money for the medical care she provided, but she brushed it off. Andrew, after extending his hand to say goodbye and shaking it lightly to Jill, suddenly lifted it and brought it to his lips. You are an amazing woman. I am happy just to know you. Oh, look how proud I am, she laughed. And she got in the car, put the key in the ignition, started the engine and waved to Andrew. Jill drove out of the parking lot and the man stood looking after her. If Andrew had known that a few days ago she had tried to kill his sister, it was unlikely that now he would talk to her so nicely and even kiss her hands. And why was she helping Clara? She was planning revenge and she's saving him. 
What a weak-willed fool scolded herself. In her condition with such a fever, was not far from sepsis. Life itself would have avenged her. But no. She started the EVs, saving her life. Who are you helping? The one you were ready to kill recently. My inner argument with myself continued until I entered the department. And then all my thoughts were occupied by work. The night shift turned out to be hard, surgery after surgery. And in the morning, her shift came. She had to work a full day. Twice during the day, Clara called, telling her about her condition and begging her to come and see her, at least for a minute. Jill was exhausted to go to Clara. She didn't want to at all, but the goal of ruining her life, the revenge to be served cold, screamed that she had. Andrew brought it from China. You can taste it gradually, and the woman rushed to get a cup for Jill. I really want to ask you, how does postpartum psychosis manifest itself? Clara is acting strange. The baby is with us all the time and she leaves. I ask her where. Why? She screams. She doesn't talk calmly at all. What do we do, Jill? Wait till you diagnose her. I'll consult with the doctor. That's not until Monday. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have to get some sleep. Otherwise, in the morning to pick up the kids in the village, which is three hours of driving then straight back on Monday to the kids in class. And I have to go back to my shift. Jill, why didn't you tell us anything? Andrew can help, and he has a bigger car and an experienced driver, and he has time now. Thanks, but I can manage. Only her companion could no longer hear Jill. She called loudly to her son. He came in and listened intently to his mother, despite Jill's disapproval. You help us so much, you support us. Let me do something for you. In the morning, an expensive imported SUV was parked in front of the driveway at the appointed time. Andrew politely opened the doors of the car, inviting Jill to sit in the front passenger seat. Then he smoothly pulled out of the yard, drove out of town, and confidently drove the car on the snow-covered highway. Andrew, do you have such a solid car? What do you do? Jill was actually curious as to what kind of man Andrew was the one who never took his eyes off her every time he met her. I tried to tell you about myself when I was walking with the baby, but you didn't seem to be listening. I'm sorry, I must have been lost in my own thoughts, confused Jill. She'd really let it pass her lips at the time. To make a long story short, I lived up north for a long time. My wife and I ran our own business. A year ago, she died in a traffic accident. She liked to drive at excessive speeds. We had no children, so I sold the business and returned to my hometown. I planned to build a small pipe rolling plant here. In the meantime, I helped my mother and sister. Can you tell us about yourself? I don't really have anything to say, but like you briefly. Married, two kids, getting a divorce. The conversation didn't go any further. Andrew turned on the music and Jill listened without ceasing to marvel at how well the playlist was put together, only her favorite songs. She did not notice how she fell asleep, and when she woke up, the car was driving into the village. Where do you want me to go next? Andrew asked, noticing that she opened her eyes. Look here on the main road. At the intersection on the right, there's the third house from the corner on the left. At home, they were waiting. Mom fussed around the table, hugging her and the children. Jill introduced Andrew, explaining that he was her mate's brother. Jill, Andrew, wash your hands. We're going to have lunch. My mother invited me to the table, arranging the plates. Ashley's daughter was on duty at the stove. She was deftly developing borscht. Son Steve played with the little ones. After dinner, Teddy a year and a half old, suddenly climbed into Andrew's arms and began to say something important in his baby language, looking intently into his interlocutor's eyes. He feels that you are a good man. Grandma didn't hold back her smile. He usually doesn't even go near strangers. I love children very much, Andrew confessed. It's a pity I don't have my own, so you're still young, and you will have children for sure. I hope so. I have long dreamed of having a large and friendly family. Jill had no idea her new acquaintance could have such dreams. 
She didn't know much about him, though. In the meantime, the parting was now inexorably approaching. At the door, the children put out bags, bags, boxes. Ashley Bob. Where did so much stuff come from? Jill was surprised. Mom, we want to take Teddy into town, her daughter said. Grandma will take it easy, and we can take turns with him. Jill wondered. The kids can't really assess the situation. They want to help Grandma. And her own heart breaks with pity for the little ones. But right now, she just has no idea how to organize family life and fit a child and a half into it. Here's the thing, my dears. Your generosity is very commendable, but it is better to let Grandma and the children move in with us, at least for a while. And let us first prepare our apartment for the arrival of our guests. What do you say? Everyone was happy with such a proposal. We arrived in the city at dusk. Jill and the children unloaded their things. Andrew helped them carry the luggage into the apartment. He was immediately offered warm tea. Ashley turned on the kettle and Jill started to fuss over the stove. I want to tell you, Jill, I really like you, Andrew admitted when Ashley poured his tea and went into the room. Jill froze in front of the frying pan where she was frying croutons. She had noticed the way Andrew looked at her without those words, of course, but his confession caught her off guard. I understand that what I said may have come as a bit of a surprise to you, the man continued, because Jill didn't say anything back. But please give me a chance to win your sympathy. And now I had better go. After a quick goodbye, he left the apartment and Jill realized that the toast was burning and turned off the gas. Somehow, my plan is going in a completely different direction, she thought. And what would she do with this unexpected bow? The next day, Jill was returning from her shift when she saw Andrew's car in the parking lot of her house. And when she walked into the apartment, she was amazed. The kitchen was tidy. The kids and Andrew were talking quietly at the table, eating pizza, obviously brought by a guest. Mommy, come quickly to the kitchen. We are waiting for you. The daughter was pleased when she noticed Jill. Good evening, Andrew said hello. I was just passing through. I decided to visit the guys. I'm sorry I'm not invited. Forgiven, laughed Jill. I'm hungry. I'm dying. Mom, here are some flowers for you, Ashley said, nodding toward a vase on the windowsill with a bouquet of delicate roses that Jill didn't notice right away. Thank you. She was embarrassed. I love roses. I'm glad I guessed. Andrew smiled, pushing up a chair for Jill. At the table, the conversation took a different turn. The children had asked to go to the skating rink tomorrow morning, but Jill had to go to work and she didn't want to let the children go alone. Besides, she had to go to the village in the evening to pick up Mom and the kids. Jill, I can go with the guys to the ice rink, Andrew suggested. And in the evening, with or without you, bring your mother and the kids from the village. No. It's better to postpone the trip to the rink, objected Jill. But Mom, that's how winter will end, started nagging Ashley. We'll go with Uncle Andrew, Steve insisted. Jill, can we not ruin the plans of young people? With a smile asked Andrew. But for some reason, that phrase threw off all the placid mood of Jill. She wanted to tell him sharply to mind his own business, and in general, to mind her own business. It seemed like he was already too much in their lives, but she held back as best she could. Andrew, I think the guys will have no problem moving their plans for a couple of days. Still sharp, she said, and I'll go to the village on my own. You're already overly involved in our lives. He didn't have time to answer because his cell phone rang immediately. Andrew came out of the kitchen into the hallway, but came back almost immediately, extremely anxious. Jill, I'm sorry, I have to go. Something terrible has happened again. I'm coming with you. Jill pulled herself together in an instant. Thoughts were born in her head. Martin must have come now and explained himself. 
I wonder how the hubby will behave, will he even ask about our children? Or has his love for Clara clouded his mind? And what happened between them after all? We drove in silence. Andrew gave Jill the occasional guilty look, but said nothing. She didn't think it necessary to have a conversation. He th she knew that she had been harsh with him, and he didn't deserve it. I can't stop admiring you. You gave up everything to come with me, to support your sister. Finally, he said, I'm sorry if I was tactless in talking to your children. Jill only nodded, but she was ashamed. She was actually trying to settle a score with her husband and his mistress. And Andrew is quite sincerely convinced of her kindness and is trying to win her sympathy. They enter the apartment 15 minutes later. Clara's mother met them on the threshold with the baby in her arms, gave her a sedative and put her down. In a whisper, she reported, there was so much going on. I was afraid she'd do something to herself or Matthew. What on earth happened? Andrew asked. I still didn't understand anything you said on the phone. Matthew's father called and said he wasn't coming, Grandma said, coming back from the nursery, where she had left her sleeping grandson in the crib. What's so tragic about that? Jill wondered. He said he was never coming back because he'd met his true love, and he didn't want the baby and he didn't want Clara either. What a womanizer, Jill blurted out. I would have put it differently, but I won't. Clara's mother said, If I'd seen him, I'd have scratched him out. My little girl suffers so much. Jill turned back to the wall and grinned. So much for the boomerang coming back. She didn't even have to do anything herself. After all, he took care of everything himself. Except Jill wouldn't get her husband back. Does she really need him? Especially after all this? Jill! It's so good that you're here. Clara came staggering out of the bedroom. I need your help. I want to give up Matthew. I don't think I can help you with that, Jill objected. I can't see him. Angrily, Clara chanted, as if she didn't hear her answer. He reminds me of his father, the old goat he's so lucky. A young and beautiful girl gave him a son, and he doesn't need one. Wait a minute, Martin. It will not be enough for you, Clara whispered angrily, and tears came out of her eyes. I don't have to make much of an effort here either. Mentally, Jill noted. Now the former mistress would get her own revenge on her husband. What a stroke of luck. My daughter, calm down. Her mother hugged Clara and stroked her on the head like a baby. That bastard will get everything back and you have a child to raise. Mom, I'm not going to raise the baby by myself. That's not what I wanted at all. How do I live now, damn that jerk? I don't know why I ever got involved with him. I don't know why I ever got involved with him, idiot. And Ruth stood back and watched in silence. If you want to give up the baby, I'll adopt him. He suddenly said in such a tone that Clara immediately stopped cursing Martin. You do not want. I'll raise him. Only sister, think carefully because there is no way back. What kind of mother are you? Stop it now. Andrew, why are you doing this? Frightenedly said the baby's grandmother, Clara. I didn't want to be a witness to a family dispute, Jill said. You can do without me here, and I'll go resolutely, she said, and quickly left the apartment. Only now she realized that she hadn't had the foresight to arrive in Andrew's car, so she would have to call a cab coming down the stairs. She thought she even felt sorry for the young, silly Clara, and her gloat immediately faded away. Already on the street, Andrew caught up with her. I'll take you home. Quietly, he said. The prickly winter wind crept under her clothes. She decided it was more expensive to argue now. And as soon as Andrew pressed the alarm fob and got into the interior of his SUV, Jill felt completely devastated. Can we switch to you? Suddenly the man on the road asked. How do you like it? Do you regret witnessing this drama? I admit it's unpleasant, to say the least. And Jill really wasn't being deceitful. She didn't feel satisfied that her husband's mistress was now suffering as she had recently suffered herself. You are such a sensitive person. Andrew noted with admiration. 
I am so lucky that fate has brought us together. Even if I have to deal with my sister's problems in this way, but I am glad that you are there now. Bright, kind, the sweetest. He stopped the car at a traffic light while the light was red and touched her fingers. But Jill jerked her hand away sharply. You're wrong. I'm not like that at all. Jill's eyes flashed with lightning. If you knew who I really was and what I wanted to do to your sister, you'd at least stay away from me. What are you talking about? Andrew clearly wasn't expecting to hear such a confession. I made friends with Jill because I wanted to hurt her and Martin. Jill blurted out. But why? Andrew wondered. Martin is still my legal husband and the father of my children. On New Year's Eve, he left me because he said he had been in love with another woman for a long time, and he did not intend to live with me anymore. I wanted to hurt my separated woman just as much as I did back then. Yes, Andrew remarked, rubbing his forehead in surprise as he turned toward Jill's house. But now your husband has left Clara, or maybe he didn't leave you for her, but for the other woman he's with now. You're right, and I almost killed your sister. But in words, both Clara and Martin were ready to kill. Andrew stopped in Jill's driveway. It was not in words. Tears rolled from her eyes, and I'm scared to think about it now. Don't come see me again. She quickly got out of the car and disappeared into the driveway. Now Andrew knew all about her. For sure, they would never see each other again. And it's for the best. She had to get a divorce from her scoundrel husband. It's just a question of how to go on. And Mummy needs help with Alice's children. And where is her sister now, I don't know. Why is everything piled up? In the apartment, she immediately went to the shower. She stood under the warm jets of water and cried. She felt so sorry for herself and her children. Because of Martin, she had not graduated from university. For the sake of her children, she endured humiliation. And what would happen next? No one knows. Yes, and this Andrew pukes his heart out with his attention. Still, she was pleased that he liked her, especially after she was so humiliated by her husband, but now Andrew will be in the past. She forbade him to come, and he himself would hardly want to see her after what she had told him. In the morning, she felt broken, but she found the strength to smile at her reflection in the mirror. She had read somewhere that it helped her to tune in to a positive mood. And indeed, her mood improved a little. She made breakfast for the children and went to work. The day went on as usual, and in the evening, she was going to pick up her mother and nephew in her small car. She and the children had already rearranged the apartment, setting aside one room for mother and toddlers. All that was left was to bring them in. And though tired, she was ready to knock Jill off her feet. She poured coffee from the machine into a paper cup before she left the hospital to cheer herself up a bit, and as she walked toward her car, which had been lightly snowed in, Andrew came up to her at a brisk pace. Out of surprise, Jill dropped her cup, which landed precisely in the trash can. Let's take my car. It has more room, Andrew suggested, and I'll buy you coffee on the way. I don't understand why you're here. It was like Jill was frozen in place and couldn't make a move. You know who I am now and what my plans were. But they have changed, haven't they? Or is it still you want to hurt my sister? I don't want any more, Jill said honestly. And I believe you. And as for your husband, divorce would help. Or are you going to try to get him back? No, of course not. What are you talking about? Jill got indignant. That's what I wanted to hear you say before I told you how I felt. Andrew paused. I love you, Jill. Let me be there for you. When did you have time to love me? She was surprised, noting that she was very pleased by his confession. Probably at first sight. Andrew smiled. I immediately thought that you, my woman, as soon as I saw you. But I'm not ready for a new relationship yet, said Jill confusedly and I'm not rushing you. Now let's go to the village and pick up your relatives. And then I need to go away for a few days to solve some issues related to business. That'll give you time to think. 
Sunday morning, Jill got up early. She had to make breakfast for the big family, but her mother was already rattling around in the kitchen by herself. She and Andrew had brought her and her granddaughters from the village the day before. It became crowded in a three-room apartment at once. After all, in the near future, we would have to solve the housing problem somehow. In addition, it is not yet clear how long Jill herself and her children can live in this apartment. How Martin will dispose of the living space is unknown. And he inherited the apartment before he got married. Daughter, I can see and feel your condition, Mom began as they sat down at the table for tea. You need to rest. Please take at least a week off and go somewhere. You're exhausted. You know, Mommy, you're right. I really do need a rest. I'm very tired. We were going to go to the sea with the whole family, and the vouchers are already booked. So you go by yourself, and I'll stay with the kids. Don't worry. We'll manage here. At work, they let her go without a word, and the children were supportive. Jill hadn't been this excited about a trip in a long time. She bought one trip just for herself, a seven-day tour in a luxury hotel, a week without surgeries, problems, or worries. How great, she thought. She chose a swimsuit. She took the children to the skating rink. She hadn't thought she would want to put on skates herself, but unexpectedly, she decided to get on the ice too, and it gave her a lot of pleasure. On the eve of her flight, Jill had anxious thoughts that Martin might arrive and ruin everything. And when the doorbell rang one evening, she shuddered, thinking that her worst fears were about to be confirmed. Only on the threshold, she saw not Martin, but her sister Alice. In an expensive, beautiful coat with a fancy haircut and generally in full dress. Can I come in? Alice asked when Jill stood at the door without saying a word. Come in, she finally said, and stepped aside to let her sister pass. I'll get the kids Alice briefly through. Did you remember that you have children? Jill asked angrily. Please dispense with the accusations. Alice, daughter, the mother, came out into the hallway and threw herself into the arms of her youngest daughter. You finally arrived. We've been waiting for you. At least you're happy for me. My sister's looking at me like a wolf. Jill shook her lips, but remained silent. Alice's children ran out of the room. The little girl immediately ran up to her mother and the baby a moment later, followed suit. My kittens, my mother came for you. Alice cradled her children in her arms. Will you tell me where you've been? Jill demanded. Will you let me pass, or won't you let me go further than the hallway? Alice parried. Okay, sister. Let's talk like adults. In a softer tone, she suggested. Jill exhaled. Are they really acting like girls when they were kids? It was time to have an adult conversation. Let's go get some tea while Mom packs her things, Jill suggested. Alice held out a bag of lollipops to Jill's children, who stared at the unexpected visitor with surprise, not recognizing her as their aunt. Taking the bag, they disappeared into the room with the kids, and the sisters were left alone. Jill, I'm sorry. Alice came out. I wanted to apologize to you for our fight for a long time. Your Martin and I were just fooling around. I didn't have any dirty thoughts on my part, though I wanted to annoy you. I was always jealous of you as your big sister who did better than I did. That's why I didn't explain anything at the time. But I didn't think what it would lead to, that we would stop talking for a few years, that you would forget your way back to your parents' house, all because of me. But I paid the price for that, or something else you know. Yes, my mother told me. Jill, after her sister's apology, instantly softened. I'm sorry for you. I'm so sorry, and Daddy died without me, Alice cried. I had to leave so quickly that I didn't even have time to warn anyone. My man and I, along with him, we were in such a mess. We were in such a mess. We were indirectly responsible for one man's death, but now everything is sorted out. We are in no danger, and we can take the children and live together in peace. Who is your man? 
Is he married? How long are you with him? Jill inundated her sister with questions. He's a good man. We love each other. He's recently divorced and we're getting married very soon. Ashley reported on her progress and occasionally complained about her brother. Steve denied the accusations and shared his news. And Jill waited anxiously for a call or message from Andrew, but he was silent. Well, I guess it wasn't meant to be, she decided. It looked like his declaration of love was worthless, and the feelings were fleeting if he forgot about her so quickly. It made her a little sad. Still, she returned home, rested, and in great spirits. And Andrew met her at the airport with a bouquet of roses. You didn't write. You didn't call. I didn't expect to see you anymore. Jill reproached him with a smile, but in her heart she rejoiced. After all, this man wanted to be there for her. At first I was out of touch and then I decided not to bother you on vacation. Shall we have dinner tonight? And Jill happily agreed. She called her older sister, whom she now sincerely considered not just a colleague, but a friend, and asked for the phone number of the hairdresser, about whom Catherine Green had once told her. And having received the message, immediately arranged a time to visit the beauty salon. She came out of it completely transformed. Her hair color was darker, and her new haircut made her look younger looking at herself in the mirror. Jill noted that she had a completely different look now, and overall she looked great, as if she had actually lost a few years. Tanned, beautiful, slender, and still a young woman. Daughter, you look beautiful, Mom said, as Jill stepped out in a pearl-gray floor. Length dress and high-heeled shoes as Steve expressed his delight, and Ashley held up a thumbs up. Jill arrived at the restaurant in a cab. Andrew was already waiting for her. He did not hide his delight when he saw the beloved woman when she entered the hall, and then said so many nice words, as she had never heard from her husband in all their life together, and she did not want to remember him anymore. She enjoyed her interactions with the man, understanding that they had the same family values preferences in music and food. He lost his father when he graduated from high school, became a support for his mother and younger sister, and dreamed of having a large family of his own. And Rue admitted that, like Jill, he himself experienced betrayal by those closest to him. His wife was in the car with her lover, Andrew's best friend and companion, when she was involved in an accident that cost her life. They left the restaurant near midnight, Andrew called a cab and told the driver an unfamiliar address. I want to show you something, he informed Jill cryptically. As the car drove past the mall, Jill recalled meeting a fortune teller who had told her she had true love. The prophecy is coming true. With a smile, she thought. Andrew was really in love with her. Yes, and Jill's heart had already cooled down and the brightest feelings were brewing there. In the entryway, he pressed the elevator button, and they went up to the top floor. There was only one door. Andrew got the key and opened it. He took Jill by the hand and led them inside the large apartment. Four bedrooms with large rooms, a large living room, a dining room, and a kitchen with beautiful furniture and the latest appliances. Finally, they walked out onto a huge loggia. Here's where it really took your breath away. Like the panoramic grounds and the whole city was as if it were in the palm of your hand. Down below, toy cars seemed to be driving around dull. Sized people scurrying about. With all the hustle and bustle, worries and things to do, we don't always have time to see the beautiful things. Just to stop and look. It's beautiful, isn't it? Andrew asked. Very, exhaled Jill. I'm not rushing you. But know that I'll be happy if you agree to live here with me and your children. There's room for your mother, as you notice, too. I want to marry you, and that is a serious and thoughtful decision. But I'd have to get a divorce first, laughed Jill. And as if in response to her words, the phone rang. On the screen of the cell phone, the husband came up. I'll have to take this. 
Jill entered the room and sat down on the couch. I'm listening, she said in response to an insistent hello. Jill, are you home? I'll be right there. Martin spoke as if his betrayal hadn't happened, as if nothing had happened at all. We need to talk. I'm ready. Tomorrow at six o'clock at the restaurant. And she said the name. Let's have some coffee, Andrew suggested as Jill pressed the buzzer. They just settled down with the little checkers of the cozy round table. As the cell phone rang again, this time Andrew's. The call was from Mom. Andrew's son, the woman, spoke excitedly in a way that could be heard by Jill as well. Matthew's grief. Stricken father is banging on our door and she won't let him in. The neighbors called me saying he's threatening to break down the door, screaming so hard the whole building is awake. Can you come over? Keep him quiet. Mom, have the neighbors call the police. And Clara, why isn't she answering? I'm calling her. She's not picking up. Andrew, you better go, Jill said quietly. And I have to go home. Okay, Mom, I'll be there. There were two cab cars waiting in the driveway. Andrew helped Jill into the back seat. We've had our evening ruined, he said sadly before closing the door. I hope the next time we'll be without the intrusion of unpleasant people into our lives. Me too, Jill smiled. And when she returned home, the children and mother were awake. They told each other that Martin had come to talk to her, but when he made sure she was gone, he left in a hurry without explaining anything. Didn't he talk to you? Jill asked the kids. Bringing gifts, Steve kicked the box on the floor with his foot, thus expressing his disdain for his father and his solidarity with his mother. And I don't even want to look, and I don't want his presence, Ashley declared. She took her mother's side, too. No, my dears, sternly objected Jill. Our relationship with Daddy is only our business, and he is your father, and you shouldn't cut him out of your life. He left me, not you. So open your presents and see if there's anything useful or interesting in them. Children looked at each other, took the box, and went to their room. You said it right, praised Jill's mother. Martin won't stop being a father to them, and I'm glad you're dealing with your resentment and anger. I have good helpers in this case. Jill smiled and hugged her mother. But I have a meeting with Martin tomorrow. I want him to sign the divorce papers. Just before she went to bed, she read a message from Andrew, who wished her good night. When she asked how Clara was doing, she got the answer. When I arrived, he had already left. Clara and Matthew are fine. At the restaurant, Jill prepared for her meeting with Martin even more carefully than she had for her date with Andrew. She put on a new dress she'd bought on vacation and jewelry to go with it, put on bright lipstick and smiled at herself in the mirror. She wondered to herself why she had so much self-confidence and calmness. The hall of the restaurant was not crowded on a weekday. Martin was sitting at a table and was twisting a menu in his hands, glancing at the entrance. He didn't seem to recognize Jill. She grinned, took off her coat and handed it to the girl in the check room, and then walked confidently and unhurriedly, tapping her heels over to Martin. I didn't recognize you. He exhaled in surprise. You look amazing. You're gorgeous. I admire you. I don't remember you complimenting me like that before, Jill remarked coldly. She sat down in the chair. The new hobbies was in the first place. At home, all you did was give orders. Forgive me. Martin put his head down. I realized a lot of things. What? Kicked out of everything. Jill grinned. What makes you think that? I just realized that the most important thing I'm missing is you and our kids. The waiter brought the wine and cheese and, well, the slices. Jill picked up a high stem glass with a deep burgundy colored drink. I want to thank you so much for your meanness for your betrayal, for everything that allowed me to revise my life. Martin stared at his wife in bewilderment. Yes, thanks to everything that's happened in the last couple of months, I really am a different person. If you hadn't left me, I'd be running around torn between cooking and cleaning and work and wanting to please a scoundrel like you. And then I'd be horrified to realize that my life had passed me by. You're a scoundrel, Martin. 
Jill sharply spewed wine from her glass into her almost ex-husband's face. He jumped up, grabbed some napkins, began wiping his jacket, shirt, and tie of burgundy stains. Are you all in cahoots or something? He shouted, and then stopped. I guess that's all you're worthy of. Jill got up and left the hall without looking back. She rode home in a cab and felt the deepest pleasure. Three months later, she was holding the divorce certificate in her hands. They had agreed on how much Martin would pay each month for the support of his son and daughter, and Clara finally found out who Jill really was. Admittedly, no one let her know what Jill was plotting against her when she was left abandoned, and then her status as the ex-wife of her former lover changed rather quickly to that of her brother's fiancé. And soon Andrew and Jill were married. Clara also found happiness. Her former classmate finally waited for her to return the favor after a long courtship. At her wedding, Jill accidentally dropped a plate on the floor, and it shattered into tiny pieces, reminding her of how she had once pounded dishes in a fit of anger and despair. For good luck, Andrew and Clara's mother exclaimed happily, and Jill agreed. Of course, for luck. <laughs>